Hey YouTube, it's Justin aka Demonic Sweaters. Time for another drum vlog. Today is episode number 13 and I'm standing here in my kitchen just heating up some coffee. I just woke up not that long ago which is why I kind of look like crap. But uh, so yeah, I don't even know why I'm shooting a video like this but I guess it is a vlog. Um, heating up some coffee. Today I have a few errands to run. I need to run to the post office to ship a electronic drum cover kit that I sold as well as I'm sending back those uh, visualize symbols to Pintech to see if they can send me some better ones. <laughs> um, now I need to make an update or I will make an update to that video about the Pintech visualize symbols. Um, I had some problems with one of them but then as I was playing them longer after making the video I started having problems with both of them. I'll detail it more in the other video. Um, so uh, I want to keep you guys updated on that, uh, what's happening with those, but I'm going to send them back. I spoke with uh, the owner of Pintech about them, and uh, he said just go ahead and send them back, and he'd send me some replacements, so going to be doing that. Sorry, I'm pouring coffee as I'm talking. Um, and then I'm going to head to the drum room, and I found some like uh, stock heads from my Tama Club Jam Flyers kits, both of them that I have. Then I'm going to put on that little E-Star kit because I have basically enough uh, to put the, to replace all the stock heads on the E-Star, except for the kick drum. Uh, but all the toms and the snare I can replace. And I have a lot of modifications I'm going to be doing to that drum kit too, but I can only do a couple of them today, I think actually just the heads. And then I just want to go over there and just sort of jam around and make some music and stuff. So. Uh, for lack of not really having any other video to do today, well actually I have plenty of stuff that I could be doing, but I didn't feel like doing any of them. So I figured I'd just make another vlum, vlum drug, drum vlog. So that's what I'm doing. All right, next step is drinking so coffee. So here's all those Thomas stock heads I have. Uh, here's a 10 inch, there's an eight inch. This will work on the eight inch Tom for the uh, E-Star. This will work on the 10 inch Tom. And then I have a 10 inch uh, coated head that I can put on the snare. And then a 12 inch coated head that came on the snare of my Club Jam Mini. Uh, so I'll have one coated on the floor Tom, but that's okay. I mean, these heads really aren't that bad. The Thomas stock heads, they're, you know, fairly thick and they're about like a ambassador weight. Um, so they're really not that bad heads. They're definitely better than the ones that are on there that came from E-Star. Although they don't sound bad, those ones from E-Star, they're just kind of thin, so I'm afraid I might break them. Uh, the one on the bass drum, though, I put on like one of those uh, Aquarian kick pads, so I'm pretty sure that one should hold up for a while with that on there. Uh, but yeah, just want to show you guys those. Uh, these came on all the Tamas that I bought last year. Just a quick view outside. It's very sunny out there today, which is nice. Nice change. Though it got cold again. Yesterday it was pretty warm, but it was gross and rainy. And today it's like down in like the like low 30s, I think, or maybe even 20s. It's pretty chilly out there. Uh, yeah. Also, this camera. Wait. Also, this camera that I'm shooting on, that I always shoot these drum vlogs on. It's my Sony. Uh, what is this thing called? CR. No, CX405. Um, it's kind of breaking. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's still working fine, but I messed up the screen on it somehow. When I had it in my bag, it became like really loose, so I took it apart to try to fix it. And what happened is I lost one of the screws, and then I was trying to put this plastic part back on and then snapped this little piece. So now the screen is like, uh, it doesn't seem so great. So I actually ended up having to order another vlog camera. So I found a refurbished, uh, another version of one of these. It's like the CX2 something. Very similar camera. I actually had one in the past. It just has less of a uh, zoom, which I don't really need that much for these vlogs. But I, I like these cameras because they have good sound on them and they're easy to use and they're lightweight. They're really good to carry around. I mean, I could use my phone, but uh, I, I don't like to use my phone for the vlogs for a couple of reasons, and the main reason is, uh, you know, I like to be able to use my phone for other purposes, you know, to go online and stuff like that, and also, you know, you kind of wear down your battery if you're filming on your phone all day, and it eats up storage space, because iPhones, as you know, if you're an iPhone user, they don't have any slot for like an SD card or anything like that, so it's really easy to fill up the space on an iPhone. Whereas this camera, I can put SD cards in there and film pretty much as much as I want all day. This is another thing I've been meaning to make a video about, but I haven't yet. Uh, this is a basically a MIDI guitar that was made for, I think, 
Guitar Hero or Rock Band or one of those things. Uh, but you could totally use this as a MIDI guitar. It's got a MIDI output right there. And, uh, you know, it's all the notes are accurate. It plays like a regular guitar, even though it kind of, you know, it's not the greatest feeling thing in the world. Uh, but it's pretty cool. At some point, I'm going to make a video about that. I thought about doing that today, but I didn't. So, <laughs> just want to show you guys. And as I was walking around, I thought maybe I'd share with you guys some of the artwork I have here on my walls that you've probably seen in some of my other videos. This painting right here was actually done by my grandfather, my papa, uh, back in probably 1989 or somewhere around there. And those are his initials right here, Leonardo uh, Angelo I Quinta. And uh, I'm half Italian, and he was Italian. And uh, he's long since passed away, but it's one of my favorite things. And actually, I have several paintings, or not several, but a couple paintings that he did. I'll show you all of those. Um, but my papa was like, he never painted until he was probably like, you know, 70 or something like that. And then he just kind of went crazy and, and filled up like an entire room full of paintings. <laughs> like, and this one, I know where this is. This is actually in a place called Prickett's Fort in Fairmont, West Virginia, uh, where I, you know, it was born. And my papa used to take me down there all the time, me and my cousin Jessup, and take us down there fishing. And uh, so that's really nice to have that painting. It's like a nice memory. And uh, I should get that like framed or something. Anyway, let's move on uh, to the cross here. This is done by uh, somebody that I met on Instagram uh, named Judah. And he makes this all these very interesting pieces that he sells on his, uh, what you call it, Etsy page. And so I ordered that from him. And that is really cool. And then this is an Aztec mask that I found in Inglewood, Florida that I really know nothing about, about, but I just thought it was really, really cool. And it's super heavy. It's made out of like clay or rock or something. I don't know, but it's really heavy and uh, it's pretty neat. This painting here of the Sand Hill Crane, I think that's what that is. This is a really awesome painting. This was done by my friend's mother. Uh, and I just love it. You know, it's really cool. It's made on cardboard. And so she cut out, like if you get really close here, you can see these are all 3D. Um, and my friend's mother's name is Sanira. She, she made this, so I just wanted to, I forgot I left that out. But this is all cardboard, and so it's all three-dimensional. I'm not exactly sure how she did all this, but it's really, really cool. I really love this painting, and uh, it's great. It's one of my favorite things. <clears throat> and then, okay, over here, this is another one done by my papa. And so this one is, I believe the story behind this was it was his brother and his brother's wife. I'm pretty sure. Or maybe his brother-in-law and his brother-in-law's wife. I can't remember, but he said that they were always arguing. <laughs> so he made this painting. Uh, but I thought it was really cool. And I grabbed a couple, like most of the ones that he had, that he painted in that period where he was painting a lot, were stuff like this. They were like landscapes and kind of, you know, real simple looking, you know, typical. Uh, I mean, not that it's typical. I love it, but you know what I mean. More uh, traditional style paintings. But then there was this one, and then there was one more, which maybe some of you have seen this in some of my videos too. This one here, and this was my absolute favorite one. And I should have this uh, closer to my desk so you can see it in the videos. But I have no idea what, you know, it kind of looks like apples. You know, like, it almost kind of looks like, you know, that one almost looks like some kind of insect or something. But it's super psychedelic, and none of his other paintings looked anything like that. And I was just like, that is like so cool. And so when, you know, I was over there and, you know, he was like, you can take any of them you want. So obviously I selected this one and some of the other ones. And my cousin Jessup has a lot of the other ones too. Like he had, you know, kept a lot of those paintings as well. Uh, so it's really cool that I have those and uh, great memory. My papa was a really, really cool person. Uh, just one of my all time favorite people ever really lived a really interesting life was really great at telling stories and used to tell me I mean he told me all kinds of personal stuff about his life you know like how he ran away when he was young how he lost his virginity like everything all his personal details he would tell me and that was just really really awesome like he was just an awesome guy all right I just left the post office and I, I really hate that post office like I already prepay all my packages 
and they don't have a well they have a little drop-off slot but like literally nothing fits in there so you still have to wait in line even if you prepay so it always takes me forever i was like there for like 20 minutes just to drop off a few packages and there's always like one person working and there's a line but anyway <laughs> this is new york city it is cold today god it's freezing it was so warm and it's so windy that's the one thing about new york too is like there's a lot of wind here. Like, people call Chicago the windy city. But New York City really, especially during the winter, is just ridiculously windy. And I'm afraid the screen on this camera is going to, like, blow off in the wind or something. <laughs> now, let me show you guys some of the scenery around here. All right, that's the entrance to the subway. And, uh, disinfecting. 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. daily. Closed. You guys can see. I haven't taken the subway in months. Uh, I never really liked it, to be honest. It's disgusting. Uh, and there's rats and stuff down there. It always smells really bad. <laughs> I would not drive. Like, that's the thing. Like, you see, like, really nice cars here. But, uh, personally, I wouldn't really drive a really expensive car. All right, I found the car, and actually, I would not have found it if I didn't have an app called Spot Angels <laughs> that helps me remember where I park. It's actually a really useful app. Um, so, yeah, now I need to get some coffee, because I got kind of a late start today, and uh, I've been exercising a lot, and I'm really tired. Well, not tired, but just physically a bit sore and worn out. So, but man, it's cold. I tried to stop at this, there's this other little cafe over there that's really good and I try to get some coffee there but it seems like every time I go in there there's like somebody in front of me that has like eight million questions and that happened this time and I just did not have the patience so I'm just gonna go through the Dunkin Donuts drive through um, yeah so anyway where's my keys ah! oh they're in the ignition I don't know if this camera's gonna stay like this if I'm driving maybe I have it on a tripod that's kind of standing on the floor of the, uh, oh, let me turn that down. Standing on the floor of the passenger seat. We'll see if it holds up. Man, it's cold. <sighs> Too cold. I can't wait until spring is fully here. Ah! Okay, that's not gonna work. <laughs> that's gonna cause an accident. All right, I'm gonna stop the camera. All right, I'm in the drum studio. Man, I really love this place. If you've been watching this drum vlog for a while, you've followed my journey through various uh, drum locations. Actually, even before I started the drum vlog, uh, I should have, I wish I had started it like a long, long time ago, because if you go way back on my channel, you can see a lot of different studios that I've rented in uh, over the years. There was one really big one that I shared with Ronan, which was great as far as the size went. It was huge, but it was really far from my house, and some of the other people that were renting there, uh, I had some problems with. They kept using my stuff without permission and leaving beer bottles all over the place. So anyway, I had to get out of there. And then I had this one other little, little tiny box like type room that I think I got in like 2017 or 2018. And I stayed there for about a year. And then I moved into that other little box room. And then I moved into this one, but this one's really great. This is really the perfect size for me. Um, you know, it's big enough to do multiple things. Not really big enough for a full band but it's definitely big enough for me and the price is very affordable by New York City standards. Before I start putting those heads on uh, the E-Star, I wanted to show you guys a couple things uh, that I was trying over here on my hybrid drum setup. And uh, actually, I wanted to actually go through a lot of stuff on there because there's I realized there was a lot of details about that setup that I never shared with you guys. So I figured I would do that today. I'm trying to be more careful uh, with my camera work too, to be less nauseating <laughs> than I was in my last one. Okay, so um, let's talk about the drums. So this is the Cl Tama Club Jam Mini, uh, which actually just comes with the kick drum and the snare drum. And I bought the Tom add-on pack. 
uh, which was, I forget how much. But so then I end up with a full four piece drum kit, which is almost the same as the regular club jam, except for the bass drum is much skinnier. And actually I prefer this version because it saves more space and it sounds really good. Um, and then also the tom mounts to a cymbal stand on the side rather than from the bass drum. But you still have the option to use the cymbal holder on the bass drum, which I like. Um, at first I kind of wished it was a little bit higher, uh, but I got used to it that way. I just kept playing it and eventually I got used to it. I just basically just made my ride more flat. All right, so as far as triggers go, on my snare and my rack tom, I have the D-Drum Red Shots, which are very inexpensive. They're only like 20 bucks a piece. Or you could buy a five pack for uh, $100, which is a really good deal. And then on my floor tom, I have the D-Drum Pro Trigger. And then my bass drum, I actually have a homemade trigger. So the reason why I have it like this, well, these are a couple of things I've learned uh, from doing these hybrid setups. The more resonance and the bigger the drum, uh, the harder of a time you're gonna have uh, to get accurate triggering that doesn't double trigger or uh, miss trigger or things like that. So I had to get a better trigger for the floor tom. The red shot, it worked, but I was getting more double triggering. The D-Drum Pro triggers work really, really well. Um, another thing though, too, is you can't tune your drums too high. If you have them too high, uh, you'll get more double triggering too. And you can try to cancel that out in the module as well, but it's much easier, or you have a much easier time if you don't tune your drums up too high. And that also brings me to the hydraulics drum heads. The hydraulics drum heads work really great because they don't have a lot of overtones and they don't resonate very long. So the fact that they're not resonating too much also helps you get accurate triggering. And I don't have any muffling or anything in there. You don't have to with the, uh, the hydraulic heads. And I like the way they sound too. They sound really nice. They're very warm and uh, kind of big sounding and you know they work really really well with hybrid setups and I have them on all the batters of the drums kick drum toms and snare the only difference is the snare and kick I have blue ones and on the toms I have red ones now the thing is with my homemade kick drum trigger let me get down there this actually is a very simple trigger that works really really well I actually tried to put the red shot trigger on this kick and it did not work well at all. It was really double triggering a lot. And uh, I just made a trigger. All it is is a piezo uh, attached to a quarter inch jack, which you can see there. And it's just double sided taped to the head with a piece of gaff tape over top of it. And that is literally all that thing is and it works 100% perfectly. I don't get any double triggering. I don't get any mis triggering. It's actually quite amazing that it works that well. I don't know if I just got lucky with the type of piezo that I used, but it works really, really well. It, that's all it is. It's like literally just taped to the drum and I haven't had a single issue with it. And I've been using it like that for months. Then as far as the drum miking, I'm just using two overhead condenser mics. And one of them is a really expensive one. <laughs> the other one is just kind of a cheap uh, ML, or what is that called? MXL. A condenser, I can't remember the model number. Um, the KSM32, Shore KSM32 is a really, really good condenser mic. Uh, very expensive, but quite honestly, this MXL sounds almost just as good. And this is the, I remember what this is called, it's called the DRK. And I have two of these. And at one point I bought the uh, Shure KSM32, thinking maybe I would replace both of my overheads and got that. And I like it, it sounds really nice but quite honestly, so does that. So eventually I might just swi switch back to using two of these and then sell this bad boy because you know I can get kind of a good bit of money out of that thing. And honestly, I don't particularly need it. Um, anyway, <clears throat> it sounds good. I mean, I might just keep it, I don't know. It's working the way it is right now. And the thing is, is I can't really hear that much of a difference between those two, at least as overheads. And that's all I use them as. So the thing is, what I do here is I have basically my overhead sound blended in with my high, with my electronic sound. And the electronic sound is just the uh, Roland TD6. And the number one patch in there, at least on mine, I don't know if this one was changed a lot before I got it. It may have been, but I did a little bit of editing to the patches on there. Um, changed some sustain and couple other things, pitches. What I did is I tried to match the pitches as close as I could to my drums themselves. So it didn't sound like weirdly unnatural. 
and I pretty much just used that one patch. Uh, I've used a couple others on like experimented with it, but I always come back to that one because I think it sounds really nice and it blends in absolutely perfectly. Simple setup I have going on right now is right now I'm using the Avanti uh, Camber weird hi-hats that I've talked about before, but I really love the sound of those things. And then here I have an Avanti 16 inch crash and you might notice I modified it a bit. See all these dents? And this is something I do to inexpensive crashes and I wanna show you guys, I'm gonna make a video on this soon. Um, because really you can take a lot of cheap kind of crappy sounding crashes and make them sound pretty cool uh, by just rehammering them a bit. So I did that on that one and also over here to my right, I have a, see I just added this actually and I wanna talk about this today. Um, I've used it in the past, but this is a PST5 16 inch rock crash and I did the same thing to it because before it was very bright and you know, just kind of, uh, you know, it didn't sound bad, but it didn't sound quite the way I like it. And these are cheap, so whatever, you know, it's not gonna hurt it to do it that way. And actually you can play them like this. You know, I've never had one break on me after doing this uh, and it sounds much better, but I did have my ballistic crash, a Sabian 18 inch over here, which I still have and I still really like, but Due to size constrictions, I kind of wanted to try two 16 inch crashes rather than having an 18 and a 16 because my ride is now an 18 inch and that's that Uptown ride, Zildjian Uptown ride. This thing sounds amazing. So I just thought, you know, and I got rid of my splash over there just because of space. Um, you know, I said in one drum vlog a little while ago that I didn't want to, but it's just so much easier. You know, I don't totally need it. You know, minimal setup, two crashes and a ride. And that's fine. And I really love this ride. It sounds so good. It's really like, I think my favorite ride I've ever owned. I can't believe how much I like that thing. But also, what else? I guess that's it. So I went over pretty much everything. The heads, all the, the bottoms on the on the Tama drums are all the stock heads. Uh, I just replaced all the batters. Oh, my hardware. I have all Tama classic hardware. So I have the classic pedal. I have the classic hi-hat stand, and then I have the classic snare stand down there. And they're all of the Tama Classic variety. And plus I have, oh, except for the, the cymbal stand here, that's a Tama as well. But this is their, what's that called, Stage Master, I think. And the reason why I wanted that is just because it's a little more heavy duty to hold the rack tom. And yeah. Oh, and over here, <laughs> I keep forgetting. That cymbal stand is actually a Ludwig flat bass that I've had, even though you can't really see it. Uh, there's the bass down there. I've had those flat bass Ludwigs for a long time, like since like 2004, I think, 2003 maybe. But I have the rest of them at home on my electronic kit. But those have been great. They've lasted me a really long time. And uh, they're a little different than the ones that Ludwig makes now, uh, but they're they're similar. Ludwig, they changed their design slightly on those, but these are the ones from like the early 2000s. All right, so actually I was just comparing the E-Star heads with the Tama stock heads. And honestly, they're not that much different. Uh, they actually seem about the same thickness and, you know, about the same weight overall. But I do have, okay, so the, the E-Star came with one coated for the snare. And then I have a Tama coated uh, 10 inch as well as a 12 inch coated. So I think what, what I'm gonna do is actually just replace my Toms on the E-Star. I'm using it as a four piece. And uh, that way I'll have all coated heads on all the drums, except for the kick drum. But the snare will be the E-Star coated, or maybe I'll put the, the Tama on the snare in case it is a little bit stronger. And then the E-Star on the rack Tom and the other Tom. Or maybe I'll put, <laughs> I'm so obsessive compulsive. I'm like, well, they're Toms, so they should have, they should both have Tama, the same uh, matching brand on the Toms. Cause that's like, uh, whatever. I'm obsessive compulsive. Anyway, yeah, I'm gonna do this. So let's, let's hook this up. All right, so I got all the heads put on and I just changed out the toms. Like I said, I have the coated heads here on the toms. Set. 
Uh, I actually have some mounting hardware that I've ordered um, that's a little bit better than this stuff. This I know I will break uh, over time if I'm really playing this set. And uh, right now I have this symbol mounted to the second tom arm, so I'm still going to continue with that technique once I get the new hardware. It's basically just a better version of what is on here already. And I got some longer floor tom legs coming, some longer bass drum legs coming. Uh, so, because really right now it's kind of leaning with the bass drum lift on it, it should be more like this, like back this way. Uh, but once I get those new legs, that should be fine. And yeah, that's pretty much all. I think it sounds pretty good for what it is. I don't know how long it'll last. It may just fly apart the first time I ever use this thing busking, which is <laughs> quite a uh, good possibility, but we'll see. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it's pretty fun to play though. <laughs> Alright, so now I'm going to try something that I've never actually tried before, but I've been meaning to. And that is to basically trigger Easy Drummer with my acoustic drums uh, from my TD6 module. And that way I can have the hybrid set up with the uh, acoustics. Basically the same way I showed you before, uh, having the two overheads blended in, except for this time, with instead of the TD6, I can have Easy Drummer. Well, actually, I, the cool thing about this is I can record all of them at once. So I can have the acoustic sounds, the TD6, and Easy Drummer all recording all at the same time. And I'm going to use one of my uh, custom-made um, patches for Easy Drummer, uh, which I have up here. Let me show you guys. <clears throat> well, there's nothing to really show. I mean, it always looks the same. But I just kind of fine-tuned it to the way that I like. I mean, the, the downside of Easy Drummer, it doesn't come with a lot of sounds out of the box. Um, but it does have a lot of add-on packs that you can buy and you can customize your own sounds by tweaking settings and things like that. Though there's, it's not as like powerful as like say like a good drum module or even the TD6 for that matter. Um, but it is pretty cool and the sounds are decent quality. So I wanted to re try recording uh, like that with Easy Drummer and the TD6 and the mics all at the same time and see how it sounds. Uh, there is a drummer playing next door, so it'll probably pick up a little bit on the mics, but that's okay for just testing purposes. So here we go. Uh, check it out.
All right, I actually thought that sounded awesome. I'm definitely gonna be using that from now on. It's really the best of all worlds. You can record the TD6 module, the uh, Easy Drummer sounds, as well as the overhead microphones, and you have a lot of options if you record that way. It's really cool. Now, I did have to do some uh, latency offset from the MIDI uh, recording from the module to Easy Drummer, but that's really easy to do. Um, I could show you how to do that in Ableton. Maybe I'll do that uh, here in this video. It's probably a good idea to show you guys that, but it's super simple. So um, yeah, I'm gonna lock up here in the studio and then uh, head home and start working on that and then editing this video. But maybe I'll shoot a little bit outside too to give you guys uh, some more view of the neighborhood because I haven't done that so much here. All right, just walking back to the car now. And uh, it's still daylight out. It's so nice, it's becoming spring. Up here, these are city bikes. And you can basically rent these by the hour to get around New York. And I've never taken one. <laughs> but I took something similar in uh, Staten Island. There was Lime Bike over there, as well as when I was in Toronto a couple years ago. I used something very similar to get around the city the entire time me and Victor did, the entire time that we were there. And here's this nice park that is called Thomas Green Playground. Actually, I think we can walk through here. This is where my, where my car is parked on the other side of this. And the sun is really bright. So, show some over there. Wow, it's really bright. But yeah, this is a pretty nice area. I haven't really seen too many people in this park ever. Maybe that's just because of COVID, but. All right, this sun is just unbearable. I'm gonna pause the camera. Actually, I couldn't get through that way. <laughs> Earlier I did, but I guess I, I went a different way. That's blocked off, so. At least we're not facing the sun now. And this whole area actually is very industrial. There's a lot of like warehouses and stuff like that. And then over that way uh, is uh, downtown Brooklyn which is growing crazily, actually. It's gotten a lot bigger recently. But you can't see anything from here. This is another uh, pay by the hour rental type thing. This is called Ravel, and this is actual scooters that you can get around on. I haven't actually used one of these. They banned them for a short while there because there were so many accidents, but they're back. Uh, but I don't know, they seem like they're pretty cool. Kinda show you guys this very graffiti looking industrial area here pretty typical site in New York actually but maybe some of you don't see a lot of stuff like this this is environmental recycling of New York skateboarders tell me if my camera is nauseating I'm trying to get better at that a lot of times I whip it around so fast without thinking and then when I watch the footage back it's like it makes me sick to watch still really cold This is the other side of that park. Just walking through. See, this is what happens when you park too close to a fire hydrant. That's not me, thankfully. But I've gotten that ticket before, and it is expensive. So don't do that. You've got to be at least, I think, 12 feet away from those things. This guy's probably going to have a ticket too. Let's see. Yep. Look at that. Don't mess around with the parking in New York City. If you're unsure, just don't do it. Because you'll either get a ticket or towed. You definitely don't want to get towed here.
All right, just a quick uh, thing here before we wrap up this drum vlog. And I wanted to show you guys how to fix the latency in Ableton if you are recording Easy Drummer in a hybrid setup like I, I did. Or, you know, this could apply actually to uh, doing a few different things. Maybe even that uh, I recently made a video about how to multi-track record the TD-17 drum module. What is on my face? Oh, that's a shadow. Is that a shadow? What is that? Shadow of the mic, I guess. It's weird. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, okay. So if you look here on the screen to the right, you'll notice that that channel, that is the Easy Drummer channel. And actually, I accidentally recorded two uh, MIDI channels. I really didn't need to do that. But this is the one in uh, that has Easy Drummer on it. And you'll notice here, this latency, or this number here, minus 28.6 milliseconds. Now, that is the latency offset. And the way I was able to determine that is, actually, I need to move my camera out of the way. I'll just move this over. Um, so what you can do, ah, how did that come back? Ah, oh, whatever. Okay, we'll just leave that there. Um, this little thing down here, this little button down in the lower right-hand corner, that turns that on and off so you can see the latency offset. And the way I was able to figure out that number is if we just go in here to our options, go to preferences, and then we go to down here and we look well here this is different because i'm using a different audio interface because i'm doing well for one i'm in a different location i'm at home and also i'm using the uh built-in windows driver which has terrible latency but that's the only way i could do screen capture at the same time but you'll see output latency so whatever this or sorry not output latency overall latency whatever the number is for overall latency then you'll want to offset your midi track by that number so at the studio, my overall latency was 20, what was it? 28.6. So all I had to do was put minus 28.6 in there, and then it syncs it up just perfectly. So that's the way you can figure that out. And uh, that could work uh, for a number of other things. Now, most programs, and Ableton does too, has latency compensation like automatic when you record audio. But for some reason with MIDI, it doesn't really do it, as far as I know. Or it seems like it doesn't. Maybe I, I did something wrong. Or maybe because I was... Actually, I know why that happened. Because I was monitoring... Ableton's weird. Um, I don't think Cubase is like this, or Pro Tools. Maybe Pro Tools is. But Ableton, if you monitor in real time through the software, which is what I was doing uh, with Easy Drummer, like basically right here, if you go... Let me close this. If we go into uh, the channels here, and right here where it says monitor in auto off, I had it set to auto so I could hear myself uh, hear Easy Drummer while I was recording. But if you set that to off, it should automatically compensate the latency. Uh, that's just how Ableton is. I don't know. It's very weird. Um, and that drove me crazy for a little while uh, with audio uh, because I was recording audio and getting latency issues until I figured that out by reading a forum or something like that. Uh, that's how I figured it out. But yeah, that happens. So you have to be careful with that. But that's that's how. But if you're you know if you do have the problem, you can easily fix it uh, using the method that I showed you, uh, which was going into this view, turning on the latency view. What do they call this? They call this track delays. Um, so you could do track delay, and then you can manually put in your latency compensation there so anyway that is all for drum vlog number 13 hopefully you guys enjoyed it this is a pretty long one but i had fun i was doing this all day uh you know had a basically got a lot of stuff done did a lot of experiments and definitely enjoyed it today and thanks again out there for all of you who watch these things it's really important to me and you guys really really uh just are the reason why I do all this stuff. So to help inspire you guys, give you ideas and all that stuff. And thanks for all the wonderful comments that I get and all the recent subscribers and all of that stuff. It's really amazing. So thank you so much, everybody. And uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, click the bell icon, like button, and all that good stuff. And yeah, that's pretty much all. So have a great day, everybody. Take care.